So let's talk about lifetime planning for parents. Um, so um, as Blair mentioned uh, earlier, we want to be able to plan for um, having an alternate decision maker when we're unable, for whatever reason, to make financial decisions. So that's what we're going to talk about now. We're going to talk about power of attorney documents and what those are, and then also representation agreements, which can have an aspect of financial decision making in them. So you can have a healthcare representation agreement that also allows certain financial matters to be taken care of by the person who you name in that agreement as your agent. Um, yeah, and these... Um or represent different philosophical approaches. The power of attorney is the older document, and it it's, um, was created over 100 years ago. It's basically an agency appointment. I appoint somebody as my agent. And that's the more recognized term in the common law world that's based on the English legal system. Now, in BC, uh, we developed a thing called a representation agreement which is uh, basically the same thing. You're appointing somebody as an agent, but the representation agreement came from a different philosophical approach because there was a perception that in order to have a power of attorney, you have to have capacity. So what do you do about people who may not have the necessary mental capacity to manage their own affairs? Because if you are able to manage your own affairs, you can appoint an attorney to help out. But if you're not able to manage your own affairs, then you don't have the capacity to appoint an attorney. So you're into a catch-22. So they developed the representation agreement specifically for people who might ha not have that mental capacity ability. Um, so it's a different philosophical approach. The power of attorney is I'm in control of my life and I make my choices. The representation agreement is, well, maybe I don't have that capacity. Maybe I need a bit of help. And um, it's, it's more for people with, um, who are in that gray area. Mm -hmm. So that's the, why we have the two documents. It's a bit unfortunate that we didn't use power of attorney with a slightly different name because in any other jurisdiction, people will understand when you say power of attorney. If you say representation agreement, they'll say, what's that? Mm -hmm. um, but that's the way the law developed. So the what, I guess you already covered. Yes, so power of attorney agreements um, cover only financial matters, and they can be broad or they can be limited. So for example, if I decided I want to backpack through Europe and my condo I'm going to put up for sale, and hey mom, while I'm gone, can you please deal with my condo? So the sale that happens, if I get an offer or whatever and I'm traveling the world, can you please accept that offer, sign the documents, etc.? So I can appoint my mom as my power of attorney in a power of attorney document that's limited in its scope um, and that's quite simple. And she'll then have the authority to deal with the bank, to deal with the lawyers, whatever it is. She can sign things in my name because she's my power of attorney. That's an example of a, of a um, uh, sorry, limited power of attorney. Or I can say, hey, mom. I trust you, I'm going to travel and I'm going to do all sorts of other things, but I'm, I'm going to be around. I can deal with my own condo when I need to, this sale. Um, but if something happens to me like, say, on the flight back home and I'm going to deal, I think I'm going to deal with the condo sale, but something happens with the flight and I end up in a coma, if I have this more broad power of attorney document, which we call a general power of attorney, then even after I'm incapacitated, my mom can sign those documents for me, she can deal with the banking, she can deal with the lawyers, etc. So any of those financial matters covered by a power of attorney, and you can have a limited power of attorney or you can have a broad power of attorney. So we'll talk about those a little bit more yep. in the next slide. Yep. If you could flip to it. And Oh, yes, and there's certain things, to, sorry, not the next slide, stay tuned, that's coming. Um, there's certain things that your agent has no authority to do, no matter what kind of power of attorney you sign, whether it's limited or whether it's broad or general. Yeah, so the power of attorney can't make a will for you. So that's why it's important to have a will and a power of attorney because they address two different things. So the power of attorney can't change a will, can't make a will for you, uh, can't uh, designate traditionally couldn't designate a beneficiary under an RRSP or a RIF, 
Now there's a procedure where that can be done, but there's a specific statutory procedure for it. Um, can't exercise the discretion that was conferred on you personally. So if you're a director of a corporation, if you have a private corporation, and you appoint a power of attorney, that power of attorney is your agent, not the corporation's agent. Remember, a corporation's a separate legal entity. So if you appoint somebody as your attorney, your agent, they can deal with your assets, but they can't deal with the corporation's assets. So you may have to have the corporation appoint a power of attorney or make sure that your agent can then vote himself or herself in as a director of the corporation so somebody can manage the corporation's assets. Um, so um, that's important limitations to, to keep in mind. Um, the who part of it um, is the big question because if you're appointing somebody to deal, who can deal with your assets during your lifetime, they, they can do whatever you do, can do. So you have to trust them implicitly. And what I tell people is when you're selecting the power of attorney, the, and I guess I should use agent because we watch too much, we watch a lot of American TV. And in the US, they call lawyers attorneys. <laughs> But a power of attorney, you don't have to be a lawyer to be a power of attorney. You're just an agent. So anybody can be, you can, you can appoint anybody as your agent. A, a husband will typically appoint his or her, his wife. Wife will typically appoint the husband because they trust each other. Um, and what you're going to do is you have to appoint somebody who you trust implicitly. You know that that person has your back. And the best image is assume you're in a coma. Uh, it doesn't deal with health care. But assume you're in a coma. Who would you want at your bedside? Who's going to look out for you? That's the person that you appoint as your agent. Um, and because you're putting somebody in a position where they can abuse the authority. And this has been a problem with um, powers of attorney. People think of it as a simple document. But you're putting somebody into a position where they can do anything you can do. And, and one problem has been, you know, elderly parents give a, make uh, the child the agent. You know, the child starts thinking, well, you know, I'm going to get this money down the road anyway, so I may as well start taking some of it now uh, because mom doesn't really need it and she, you know, isn't going to be able to use it. So you do have to be careful of people who, um, because the, the agent has to act on your instructions for your benefit, but sometimes people abuse that authority. So you have to take that into account, and, and it's really important who you select. Um, any other comments? We've, we, we had a, a recent case involving a power of attorney where the, the person who was selected um, started to not realize that they were an agent and started to try to take over the person's um, life. And, and we had to tell the person, no, no, you're just an agent. You have to, what, what your principal, what your parent wants, you just implement that. It's not that you're taking over their life. Mm -hmm. You don't start saying, no, no, you can't do that um, because you have to involve the, um, the principal, the person who's appointed you, you have to involve them in decision makings. Even if they're losing capacity, you still have to consult with them and find out what they want. And it's sometimes easy for the agent to try to take over. Well, you have a legal duty to do that. As a, as a power of attorney, you have a legal duty to take into account the person who gave you that power, what they want, and you have to communicate with them. That's what the statute says. But there's nobody really out there enforcing that, right? So you have to remember when you give someone a power of attorney, when you make someone your agent, they have access, they can do everything that you can do financially. So anything with your bank account, all the money that's in it, they can take it out. They can do whatever they want with it. Your house, they can sell it, right? So it's, it's no small matter deciding who's going to be your power, your power of attorney. Yep. And just because they're your child doesn't necessarily mean because this situation, it was, it's a very sad situation, actually. The there's three children. Child 
who was the trusted one, I guess, uh, was given a power of attorney and decided, okay, I want to sell this property and didn't consult the parents, right? So then it becomes a legal battle. And so I guess we just can't emphasize enough the, mm -hmm. need, the need to trust your power of attorney. And I would recommend as well, because there are the, these legislative duties, it's a really wonderful thing up front to communicate what those are. Because a lot of times people don't know, right? They don't even know what their duties are as a, as a power of attorney. They just think, okay, great, I have signing authority, mm -hmm. um, which they do have. But they also have these, these duties that go along with it. And yep. there's not a great enforcement um, mechanism for, for the duties. But I think sometimes just communicating them up front, what the expectations are as a parent, for example, if you're appointing your child or um, as a spouse or as a sibling, if you're going to appoint um, your brother or sister or your own parent or whatever it is, I, I think communication is um, is fantastic and you maybe can read something in that situation when you talk about the power um, try to watch the other person and see if they seem power hungry I guess yeah. <laughs> and when you're appointing children you do have to be aware of sibling rivalries mm -hmm. because that's what happened in this situation I yeah. think the property that was being sold was property that was going to one of the siblings and there was sibling the rivalry and there was a bit of power struggle uh, between the children there. So, yeah. you know, you have to think about your children. Is that something that's likely to develop? Now, the, the agent does have a bunch of duties. They have to keep records because they're not dealing with their own money. They have to keep records and they have to be able to justify how they've handled that uh, money. So if, you know, if you have an agent um, and then, then you die, the executor can challenge the agent and say, okay, what happened to this money? You have to justify it. You've got to keep records. So the person who you're appointing has to understand that they have to keep records of, of what they're doing with your money because they can be in a bad situation if they can't justify what they've done. Mm -hmm. um, so that's just another note. Who else? This is... Yes. <laughs> The next question when you think about who's um, is whether or not you might want to appoint um, alternates. So for example, in, in the, the most common example that Blair gave, that spouses often will appoint one another, well, spouses also often travel together. So if an emergency happens um, or something really unfortunate happens with a car accident or something like that, often spouses will end up in a coma together. It's really romantic. Um, <laughs> so you might want to think about an alternate when you're appointing a power of attorney. If you're thinking that you want to appoint a sp uh, your spouse, maybe have an alternate as well in there so that if something happens to you and your spouse at the same time, um, then, then there, there's uh, something in the document already to go to right away, as opposed to having to go, pe the people who are left behind, having to go to a court and have um, a committee or committee uh, appointed, which we'll talk about later, what this committee means. Um, but basically, you have to go to a court. If there's no one to deal with these financial matters, the people who are left will have to go to court and have a court appointed one. So it's useful to think about who else as well. Yeah. And, and by an alternate, it doesn't have to be just one alternate. You can say, uh, I'll appoint my three children acting together mm. and majority consent. Now, you know, there's, there's a downside to that because then you're, you want the, the power of attorney has to be recognized by the third party, the bank. So you want to make it easy for the bank. So if the bank um, has to get two out of three signatures, as long as that's clear, um, then that's fine. If you said all three children, then they have to act unanimously. Well, that can paralyze you because maybe they, they, they have a legitimate disagreement and they can't get unanimous consent and then you can't do anything. So I don't like unanimous consent when there's more than one person. But if you have a committee of three and it's majority consent, then, you know, majority rules. So you have to think about how it's going to happen because you have to remember that the third party, the bank, whoever you have to deal with, has to be willing to recognize the authority that you've granted. Um, and if they feel that it's not clear or, or there's something that they're worried about, that, that if they recognize that authority and they've done it improperly and they've, they've dealt with the wrong person, then they're not going to recognize the power of attorney. So you want it crystal clear 
and, and you don't want to set up a situation where you could have a deadlock and paralysis. Okay. And another thing that you can do is you can actually have right in the power of attorney document, you can give the agent that you've decided to appoint, you can give them the, the power to appoint a successor as well. So that's another option. Again, thinking about flexibility, that if you have a lot of trust for that person and you don't necessarily know uh, who you want to appoint as a successor, you can give that power of attorney the power to appoint their own successor. So um, just remembering, again, that point about flexibility, um, oftentimes you'll see almost like that picture that we had of the fill in the blanks, the do-it-yourself approach, that there are absolutely you can download on the internet power of attorneys that you just fill in the blanks. They won't have that kind of built-in, that flexibility that we were talking about. So you can put in powers in, in your own document if you want them to have a power to appoint a successor, if you want them to have a power to deal with this one particular real estate but not these other pieces of real estate. It's, again, like we were saying, it's your document. So if you see something, even that a lawyer gives you, that's a template, you can say, well, actually, I have this in mind. So th these, are, these are very flexible documents, even though they might not sound like they are. 